opportunity to speak to you all and for the wonderful conference. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me get started with uh, some, some sort of general things about the uh, uh, semi stable subcategory. There's corresponding class in the group. Uh, group. Um, which just records how many times each simple appears. I'm going to be, the, the really, the, the, the takeaway uh, is I, I want to convince you that there's a certain picture that you can draw uh, for an algebra to do with stability conditions, and that it's an interesting picture, and that it's a picture that we can, we can understand perhaps better than you might expect, at least in some examples, and I think there's reason to hope that we can understand it better in, in more examples. So the examples I'm primarily going to, I'm really going to be talking about are Reprojective algebras and quotients of reprojective algebras, but I, I think um, you know it, I, I'm optimistic that we can more could be uh, figured out. So, so the, the the space in which these pictures get drawn is the dual of the Burton group, which I'm going to think of as actually a real vector space because I like drawing real pictures. And so if I have an element of this, then um, phi, then there's a notion of what it means for a module to be semi-stable with respect to phi. Um, semi-stable with respect to phi if phi of the class of M is zero, and phi of the class of N is less than or equal to zero for N any sub object. Okay, so what we can do then, given you know this point phi, is we can talk about the semi-stable A modules. Okay, so this is a and you know, so I, I specify some, some objects in, in the category, the, the semi-stable A modules, but I, I really mean the, the, the subcategory, the full subcategory. Um, this is just a collection of the five semi-stable A modules. Okay, so this this subcategory of A mod turns out. Um, that this is an abelian and extension closet subcategory. Um, so the, the reason that King introduced this notion, he was really getting it out of geometric invariant theory. I'm not going to talk about geometric invariant theory or, or at all. So, so for me, this is just this is really just going to be a black box that produces some, or, well, not really white box, but, but you know, the, the, I'm not going to discuss why one might do this procedure. For me, it's just a procedure that associates to a point in a real vector space 
a certain nice subcategory of my alpha. And then I'd like to understand what the picture that I get in this way looks like. So let's, uh, let's look at an example. Let's look at A2 quiver. Um, so what do we get? So, so you know, I have two samples, so I have a two-dimensional picture. So that makes my life easier as an artist. Um, draw something two-dimensional. About all I'm up to. So um, what do we have? Well, we have in, inside of this two-dimensional vector space, there's a hyperplane on which, right? So, so this is the space of linear functionals on the Grotendy group. So in that two-dimensional space, there's a one-dimensional line where my linear functional vanishes on one. And so at any point on that line, which I'm going to denote by class of one perp, right, because it's where one vanishes, at any point along that line, I will see that the simple one is semi-stable, because its class is zero, and it has no non-trivial subjects. Similarly, there's a line perpendicular to two, and at any point along that line, I will see the simple object at two. So, so far, this doesn't seem that interesting, but it gets a little more interesting when we think about the third indecomposable object here, um, because that class um, you know, is, is one plus two. Um, so that's, that's this hyperplane here. But what we realize is that if I'm on one side, so let me, let me indicate the positive sides of my two hyperplanes. Uh, so this is, you know, so so this is the positive side of this this guy, and this is the positive side of this one. So this is in perpendicular of one and perpendicular of two. But this is where oh, um, sorry, um, uh, this is where um, I'm going to see uh, one two. Because um, ah! <laughs> right? because uh, I'm supposed to have because one is a sub object. So no, no. <laughs> so one's a sub object. I, had right, I said I was going to do right by them. I don't know why I said that, but that is what I said. So I have one is a sub object, and is it right? So I, so I want, okay, sorry, I don't want to go over here. Sorry, I, I'm not sure why I got so confused. Right? Um, that's it. So, so the sub object is supposed to be negative. This is on the negative side of the hyperplane for one, so the sub object is on the negative side. Okay. Is it, everyone's happy. Good. Okay. All right. So, so, I mean, pictures like this, particularly for the in the hereditary case, have been studied by a bunch of people, um, uh, by Gusa or Wayman and Fodorov, uh, by Julian Kindris. Um, I have also thought about these pictures in collaborations with Colin Engels and with Charles Paquet. Um, but. Um, I, I, but I want to suggest that, that it, this is an interesting picture to draw, even if you have a non-hereditary algebra. Um, so how should you get a handle on this picture more generally? Ah, right, sorry. So I, I, should, I should, there's another uh, couple of features that I should point out. If I'm not on any of these lines, I get just zero. And if I'm here, I get everything. I'm, I'm happy or Um, so this is the line where, where the linear form vanishes on one. Okay. So this this is the this space is this space. Um, so these are linear forms on this two-dimensional Gregorian group. This is the line where it vanishes on one, and on that, if I pick any point on that line, then I get 
uh, 1 is a semi-stable object. If I'm on this line, 2 is semi-stable. Um, if I'm on this line, I claim uh, this non-simple Indiegogo module is semi-stable. If I'm at the origin, any module is semi-stable. Um, if I'm not on any of these lines, no module is semi-stable. Okay? Are we happy with the picture? Great. Um, we will see a very similar picture for another algebra shortly. Um, so, the, to think about, so to get, to get a handle on what's going on in this picture, um, it's useful to notice that it's useful to think about bricks. So the bricks of A, these are just the A modules. Um, so that's sort the of end of M is a division algebra. And um, an abelian extension closed subcategory is determined by its bricks. The bricks that it contains. Therefore, um, in order to try to understand this picture, I mean, you know, if you, if you, if you just stare at this picture, you, it, well, I mean, okay, this picture is so simple. You know, nobody's going to get confused. But if you're trying, if you're trying to understand a higher dimensional picture, and you just try to visualize, okay, what are all the different subcategories? They're all associated with some kind of convex geometric regions of different dimensions. It starts to become a bit difficult to get a handle on. But what I'm suggesting is, to understand it, we can just focus on where is each brick supported. So we find. You know, there is this line, which is where the simple S1 is supported. If you're inside, if you're on the line, you get S1. If you're not, you don't. Okay? There's the line here where you get S2, and there's this like, path line where you get one two. And and so knowing that is enough. That's really that's really has all the information because you can see. Oh, if I'm at this point in the middle, I have all of them, and so I know what bricks I have, and therefore I know the set. By this claim. So, um, yeah. So that's that sort of uh, this sort of picture is the, the kind of picture that I want to to think about. In particular, what I want to think about today is uh, this picture for a Okay. So. Let's um, let Q be a simply laced pink and quiver. Um, so type A D E. Um, I define a double quiver Q bar by saying for each arrow from I to J. I'm going to add a reverse arrow Follow a star in the opposite direction. Um, then we can define the pre-projective algebra to be the path algebra of the double quiver divided by the ideal generated by the sum over all the arrows in the original quiver of a a star. Um, so, so this is, I mean, this isn't, this isn't a, 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 a particularly inviting definition, but, um, uh, anyway, but, it, but it, it, it is a definition. Um, I, there's, there's, there's lots to be said about where pre-projective algebras come up, why they're interesting. Um, they arise in the Mackay correspondence. They, they. Uh, or a key feature of the definition, Lustig's definition of semi-canonical spaces. They show up in Geis Leclerc Schroer's categorification of cluster algebras, and they play a that's fairly central role in that. Uh, a feature of them that's going to be relevant for, for us today 
is, is the recent result by Amizno saying that uh, they are tau tilting uh, fire. So, so which, if you don't know what that is, don't, don't worry about it. But uh, um, right. so we want we want to try to understand what is, what does this type of picture look like for a spirit deck file. The, so the dimensions of the bricks of my form a brick system, it turns out, uh, or they form the positive roots of a root system of the same type Q inside her. Um, so we can take the collection um, of the uh, dual Um, and it turns out that it's an old result of Bill Carly Bobby um, that uh, to a first approximation, there's a very simple uh, picture here. Well, something non-zero, um, well, if and only if phi is on one of these points, one or more than one of these points. So in type A, picture is uh, rather more symmetrical. In the sense that if we're not on one of these reflecting hyperplanes, we have nothing. Um, and if we're on a reflecting hyperplane, we have something. But let me try to uh, let me be a little more precise about that. Um, so in this case, our algebra is just like that, and then I have relations. Compositions of uh, two arrow time regressions. Um, so there are uh, so the bricks of, in this case, um, are just all being composable. So I mean, this is this is far from this is far from the normal situation. Uh, so for for slightly for somewhat larger, not much larger, pre-projective algebras, the there are still only finitely many bricks. But the anti-composables, uh, they're infinitely many. It's they're wild, you know. So 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 the anti-composables are, are, are quite larger ones that are outside our, our things that we can hope to classify. But the bricks are very easy to understand, um, and that's that's really what I'm what I'm going to have to understand to uh, and explain to you today. Um, so in this case, well, there's just four. Um, story. Um, but uh, so what's going on here? Well, again, we have, you know, the same, the same sort of thing. Um, um, we have a line, the line where a simple one, the class of the simple one vanishes, and there one is semi-stable. Here, where the simple two vanishes, and there two is any stable. Um, but uh, what we get is uh, 
this hyperplane does not have a, it's, it's, not, it's not the case as, I don't know, I might naively have imagined I have this nice collection of hyperplanes, each of them maybe is contributing a brick, that's not what's happening. This hyperplane has gotten broken into. So, um, Racing a little bit there. Um, this part of the hyperplane has has one brick corresponding to it. This part of the hyperplane has one brick corresponding. To it. Um, so we'd like to understand uh, this whole story. How how do I how do I you know I have this reflecting arrangement and um, somehow each brick corresponds to some part of some of the hyperplanes. And we'd like to know how that correspondence works. Um, and apparently, based on this simple example, it's going to entail um, dividing some bricks, or dividing some bricks into pieces. Um, and um, you know, the easiest way to, to solve a problem I find is, is to, to, to discover that somebody else already solved it first. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I'm now going to explain uh, Nathan Reading's construction of shards, which um, he constructed, uh, uh, but to solve a different problem. So, so I, uh, so, 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 uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so I'm, I'm going to explain that now it's it's fairly combinatorial. Um, if you you really don't like that, then you know you can just, just sort of relax at the end of a, a satisfying day. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll let you know when, when combinatorics is done. But, uh, um, okay, so 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 well, so, so so let's just continue looking at this picture. What? How do I? So some, some hyperplanes got split up into pieces, some hyperplanes didn't get split up into pieces. What's the difference between the two that didn't get split and the one that did get split? Well, there's sort of one kind of obvious thing that's going on here, which is that there is a, there's a distinguished chamber in this picture. We shouldn't think of this as being you know, a completely symmetrical picture, because this chamber is, is distinguished by being the chamber where If phi, phi is in EQ, if and only if um, phi uh, um, is positive on each of the symbols. So that, that's, that's one of the, uh, the regions once we remove the hyperplanes. Um, and so this, there's this distinguished region, and what we see is you know, two hyperplanes were, were kind of were close to this region. They didn't get cut. The one that was far away got cut. Um, and it turns out that, that that rather naive observation is uh, absolutely the whole story, um, as, as Nathan figured out. So let me um, explain that. In Rn. So the chambers, right, this is just the usual word for the components of Rn with the hyperplanes removed. Um, and um, for, for Nathan's purposes, I mean, I guess technically I mean, one could formally make the definition that I'm going to make, which, which Nathan tells us to make, without this technical assumption, but let me just make this techn technical assumption, which is uh, true in the cases that we're interested in uh, anyway, um, which is that the chambers are simply And extremal rays, and being the dimension of the space, being the number 
are some ways. Um, so, um, here's a base chamber. Uh, e. And define H2 to be the set of intersections um, of pairs of hyperplanes, distinct pairs of hyperplanes. Okay, so these are the co-dimension two intersections of hyperplanes in the example we were looking at where the ambient space was two-dimensional, there was a unique such intersection, namely just the orbit. We want to we want to now focus on uh, one element on, on an element. We're just going to look at we're going to look at all of the elements of these co-dimension two intersections, um, and and we want to, to uh, do exactly what what you know this picture suggests. Um, so what that means is we have to we have to think about what what. How, how, can I, how can I conceive of what's happening here? I have this co-dimension two intersection. Well, um, um, so co-dimension two means there's two dimensions left over. I'm going to have the two dimensions that are left over be the two dimensions of the board, and the directions of x are going to be the directions perpendicular to the board, however many of them there are. I don't mind. They're, they're, they're all that way. And so the hyperplanes that contain x are lines um, like that. Okay. Right, so, so x is, is uh, dimension n minus 2. These are the hyperplanes in H that contain x. Um, and I want to number them. Um, uh, around x. But I want to do so in a way that remembers my distinguished choice of chamber. So the point is that because I had a chamber that I particularly liked, well, that was a chamber of my of my hyperplane arrangement, so it was cut out by all the hyperplanes. In particular, it lives in a particular place. I mean, it, it sits between some of. I mean, this is a coarsened arrangement because I've forgotten all the hyperplanes that weren't intersecting. So, in particular, my chamber, my base chamber lives in one of these coarser chambers. So now I just number my hyperplanes um, so that uh, I'm number them from 1 to r. So the, the base chamber is between 1 and r. Now, what I want to do is, I want, I want, now I want to mimic this. So what I want to do is I want to say, well, x is supposed to be cut out of the hyperplanes except the first one and the last one. So the way I'm going to do that formally is I'm going to define, I'm going to say x is supposed to split certain hyperplanes. They are the hyperplanes h2 up to h r minus 1 in this list. So then the shards, the way I split up <coughs> the hyperplane h is I take the components of h where I remove every x such that um, H is supposed to be split by X. Right? So, so from any particular, so we pick a hyperplane. So I've, I've done this procedure for all my co-dimension two intersections, and for each co-dimension two intersection, I produced, I found a list of some hyperplanes. I'm now going to remove X. I'm going to now I'm going to focus on one hyperplane in particular, H. From it, I'm going to remove all the X's that I found that I wanted to split H using. And so then, the 
the, the complete set of the shards is just, uh, we take all of these, we, we've broken each hyperplane up into some number of pieces, and now we're just going to collect all those pieces. Okay, so, um, so Nathan Hayden's motivation for this, um, I, I'll just I'll just mention it uh, in two sentences because you know, it's probably not not so relevant for, for most of us here. But uh, there's a well, there's a certain poset um, of regions. Um, uh, whose bottom element is that we chose a distinguished chamber. So this is a poset. There's poset structure on the chambers. Because of our technical assumption, this is a lattice. Um, and then the shards of H correspond to the joint irreducibles of this poset. Um, so that, as I said, that was, that, was, that was Nathan's motivation. That was why he introduced this definition. Um, but uh, that's not particularly important um, for my purposes. Um, so we're going to take the, we're going to take the reflection arrangement that we already mentioned, um, that probably Bowden told us we should be looking at. Um, and um, so we're going we're to consider what, what happens when we take that reflection arrangement and we take the base region that was the distinguished base region like where we had positivity um, of all the symbols. And then we have a theorem um, which we discovered in, in uh, Joint work with uh, Osamu Yama, Nathan Reading, Ian Rayton. Um, and we showed that the bricks of pi are naturally in one-to-one -one correspondence with the shards of the hyperplane. So, so that's sort of what you were expecting, but the the interest or the, the uh, but or maybe that's what you were expecting. I hope that's where you were expecting. That's sort of where we were going. Right? Um, but we, did, we, we got here by a completely different group that didn't have this picture. Um, so uh, the picture is, is the content of uh, the work with, with the expire, which says that this correspondence can be described very simply as the brick M corresponds to the shard E sub M, where E sub M, where M is semi-stable for phi if and only if phi is in the closure of E M. So what this is saying. Well, what this is saying is you know, that we really do have uh, these pictures in yeah. um, That is to say, you, know, you have this projective algebra, you have this reflection arrangement, you split up the hyperplanes into pieces, and then to each piece of each hyperplane, there's an associated brick. Um, and the brick is exactly what your uh, guaranteed to find by being in the closure of that piece. So that's the um, uh, yeah. So so in particular, that says we you know we, we have this 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 description of these pictures. Um, the what does this tell us? Well, we want to know, we wanted to know more than just where the bricks were. We really wanted to know about the abelian extension closed subcategories. And you know, if you remember, the point was 
to understand the abelian essential closed subcategories, we needed to understand which bricks uh, could be together in them. And what that amounts to is saying, I want to understand the possible intersections of shards. And so in this case, you know, here, for example, you're on four shards. And so the possible intersections are not that interesting. You could have nothing, you could be on any one of them, or you could be on all of them, and that's the story. But in general, there's a much more complicated story of, well, you know, you could be, you could be on several, but not all of them. And so how does one how does one get a handle on that? Well, the point of the point of the story is that we converted the problem of how do you understand which uh, modules can live together um, in an abelian extensional subcategory into a convex geometry problem. You know, what do the intersections of the, these regions look like? And, and that had already been thought about uh, by Nathan Reed. So let's define the shard intersections. Um, so these are the sets of things that you can write as intersections of closures of shards. So in this case, um, you know, it would be the origin or uh, the closure of any one shard or, um, or the whole space. Then the shard intersections, ordered by inclusion, correspond exactly to the semi-stable subcategories of pi. So this is just the, the remark that to understand a semi-stable subcategory, you have to understand which bricks it contains, and the shards tell you exactly that information. Um, using the result of Misno that I mentioned earlier, you can show that um, the semi-stable subcategories actually turn out to be exactly the same thing as the abelian extension closed subcategories. So uh, I, mean, I mentioned you know, that, that semi-stable subcategories are always abelian extension closed, but uh, lots of times you can have abelian extension closed subcategories that can't be picked out as any stable subcategories for any particular phi, but in fact, it turns out that all of them can be picked out in that way um, for algebras. And so, so these these chart intersections, as I said, this this isn't studied combinatorially. Um, it turns out there's a bijection to um, the the whole Coxeter group. Um, um, with a certain order called the shard order. So, so these intersections are, are somehow correspond to elements of the Coxeter group, and there's a, there's, a, there's a partial order on the elements of the Coxeter group that corresponds to inclusion of, of one intersection in another. Um, so this, this can be, this can be um, given a combinatorial description um, truly, in sort of truly Coxeter theoretic language um, uh, but I don't want to go into that. Um, um, so, so let me, let me, in the remaining few minutes, um, um, so, 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 so far we've just been talking about pre-projective algebras, but in fact, of course, we could, we could talk about we could use the same analysis to talk about quotients of pre-projective algebras if we want. Right. So the bricks of a, an arbitrary quotient algebra of pre-projective algebra um, are just going to be the modules that are bricks for that are that are already bricks for the pre-projective algebra and that are killed by the ideal. So th what this means is the, the semi-stability picture for um, pi mod i is obtained from
namely the charges that don't correspond to A modules. Um, and so what you can so you can see that that, um, that that explains the relationship between this picture here for the projective algebra and this picture for the hereditary algebra. Because what happened was this shard here is not a module for the path algebra. Um, it's not killed by the ideal that you have to quote note file um, to go from the projective algebra to the path algebra. So therefore, it disappears. And that's a way to think of how you get this picture just by starting with the shards in the reflection arrangement and erasing some of them. Um, so the um, let me just say then. So for example, one, one example of a, an interesting quotient of projective algebra, we can always just go all the way down to the path algebra for Q. Um, and then um, by killing the, the arrows that we added in the first place. Um, and so then, then what we see is the abelian extension closed categories of a q according to this analysis they're sitting inside the abelian extension closed subcategories of projective algebra these guys correspond to the bio group well it's a, an older result of my Alan Ingalls that a natural subset of the vial group that these these uh, really intent closed uh, subcategories of, of the hereditary algebra correspond to, um, which I don't want to uh, describe. But, but that makes this a little So so you can really see the the combinatorics. So these guys are called the non-crossing coefficients. see this, this uh, old uh, result sort of uh, embedded inside this uh, shard structure where you see, see the whole file. What is the vector? Hmm? What is the vector? Uh, Q to I. Um, if I have an abelian extension photos, uh, if, I, if, I have, if I have some KQ modules, they're also prime modules. If, if I have K2 modules, they are pi modules. But uh, it's not necessarily a extension code in pi. Um, great. Um, Maybe we'll get the closure. Yeah, no, what do we want to do? Sorry. Um, so I, I, well, yeah, so okay, so what I want to do is I want to take, I want to think about the sets of bricks, and if I think in terms of the sets of bricks, then I can, yeah, okay, so, okay, sorry, this was uh, an, an ill thought out addition at the end of my talk, right? Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Just to take the extension closure. Yeah, you think that's, okay, all right. Well, someone says just take the extension closure, I'm sure you 